everyone. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our Healthy Trees for a Healthy Planet webinar. Thanks for making time to be with us tonight. And it's kind of fitting that we're meeting the week of Valentine's Day because here in Bedford, we do love our trees. So my name is Eve Hunt. I'm the program director for Rooted Solutions, which is a key climate action area of Bedford 2030. And we have a great program lined up for you with fabulous speakers and facilitators who I will introduce in just a moment. But first, I'm going to speak very briefly about Bedford 2030 and Rooted Solutions. And then I will introduce each speaker in turn, followed by our moderator for a discussion period. So if you have any questions, just enter them into the Q&A. We are fortunate to have a local expert with us and one of the founders of Rooted Solutions, Karen Simons, on hand. And she'll field some of the questions as we go, or they'll be addressed during the uh, discussion period as time permits. So let's get started. So for those of you who are not familiar with Bedford 2030, we actually started out as Bedford 2020, and our goal was to reduce greenhouse gases in Bedford by 20% by 2020. And we exceeded our goal. And when I say we, it's really you and us, because while Bedford 2020 provided the tools, it's really our community members who took the actions to produce those results. So not to rest on our laurels, we immediately took on a much more ambitious goal to reduce greenhouse gases 80% by 2030 and to achieve net neutral by 2040. And we realized that we weren't gonna be able to do that solely by focusing on buildings and transportation, which are the main emitters of greenhouse gases. And that's how Rooted Solutions started. And here we will focus on reducing greenhouse gases as well as increasing biodiversity and protecting natural resources. And the way we would do that primarily is by shifting our landscape management practices, reducing food waste, making climate friendly food choices and preserving and restoring our vital natural resources that help capture and store carbon and greenhouse gases. And last but not least, increasing tree canopy, and that's what brings us to our webinar this evening. So our first speaker tonight is going to be Dr. Andrew Reinman. Let me uh, stop sharing my screen. Dr. Reinman is affiliated with the City University of New York Advanced Research Center. He's an ecologist and a biogeochemist who focuses on plant ecophysiology and the terrestrial carbon cycle. He's particularly interested in understanding the effects of climate change, urbanization, and land cover change on the drivers of carbon cycling. His research combines field observations, ecosystem experiments, and laboratory analyses with GIS, remote sensing, and modeling, with projects in forested and human-dominated landscapes throughout the mid-Atlantic and northeastern US. Tonight, Dr. Ryman will discuss trees and forests in terms of the wide range of ecosystem services they provide across urban and suburban landscapes. Welcome, Andy. Thank you. Um, all right, so let me share my screen here. Okay, does everyone see the main, the main slide here? Yeah, okay, great. Um, well, thanks for the, that great introduction. Um, so for the 15 minutes or so that I have here, I, I figured I would just talk a little bit about um, some of the climate benefits of trees. Some of these things probably most of us are aware of. I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about kind of like how trees provide these services. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about sort of at the scale of, of Westchester, what some of uh, the roles that trees are, are playing across our landscape and, and some of what we're learning about um, what might work and what might not work for increasing carbon sequestration and increasing canopy cover across Westchester or across a particular municipality. So there's, there's two main ways that trees can regulate our climate. Um, the first that we kind of hear the most about and we talk the most about is their role in carbon sequestration. And so uh, essentially what that means is that trees have this really phenomenal capacity 
to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and store it in biomass and store it in, in soils. Um, and so that carbon sequestration, same as, as carbon storage, um, to give you an idea kind of like globally what the magnitude of this is, um, that process of photosynthesis that pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then converting it into biomass, um, each year offsets about 25% of all of our carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels. Um, so globally, trees play a really important role in slowing the rate of, of climate change and providing that really critical ecosystem uh, service of, of helping to kind of modulate climate and modulate atmospheric chemistry. Another way that trees can help to regulate our climate that um, if you heard me um, speak before, you are probably familiar with this, but that maybe receives a little bit less attention is the really important role that um, our trees play in thermal regulation. So in sort of controlling climate at kind of local and regional scales. Um, and they, they do this through um, by altering surface energy dynamics. So what does that mean? That means that um, when trees transpire and they move water from the soil to the atmosphere, um, that evaporative process is a cooling process um, that is quite analogous to what our bodies do when we sweat. So when we sweat and you feel a breeze move across your body, it feels quite cold. And that's because that process of converting liquid water to water vapor consumes heat and actually has a cooling effect. And so at sort of like a landscape scale, we can sort of think of our trees as being sort of the sweat glands of our of our landscape of our municipalities, and they can be a really powerful tool for cooling things off. Um, another way that they do it is by sort of changing the color of the earth's surface. So of course, trees tend to be a lighter color than um, the developed land covers that we typically replace them with here in Westchester. And the darker a surface is, the hotter it gets when exposed to, to sun. Um, and so just by changing the color of the Earth's surface, trees can have a cooling effect. And then of course, um, we're all quite familiar with the cooling effect of uh, the shade that trees produce when we stand underneath them on a, on a hot day. Um, and so through these processes, um, not only do trees have an impact on local climate, but by cooling things off locally, they're reducing our need for energy to cool our homes. And that of course has impacts on carbon emissions to the atmosphere. So um, through a variety of direct and indirect mechanisms, trees are actually playing a really important role in regulating climate at local to global scales. So what does this look like? So we're probably all super familiar with trees storing carbon above ground, right? So here's a little cartoon of a tree and, um, and, and so trees grow outward, they grow upward and all the, the material that's used to create that biomass is essentially derived from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And so everything that you're seeing in a tree is uh, essentially carbon that at some point in the tree's life was removed from the atmosphere. Um, some work that we've done over the past five or six years and other groups have done similar work in different places. What we find that's really interesting is that um, when we compare rates of tree growth in a forest setting, so that's sort of these two data points that I'm showing you here, this um, metric basal area increment is just sort of like the, the amount of wood that a tree is putting on around the circumference of the tree each year. Um, all you really need to know is that a higher number means faster growth. But what we find is that um, when compared to trees in a forest setting, those that are in urban settings, so the trees in our backyards, um, sometimes even the trees along our streets, can grow two times or more faster than that same tree in, in a forest setting. Um, to, and, and it's not just like maybe it's different trees. Some of these data points, like this data point and this data point, that's the same exact tree, just a few years apart between when that tree was in the middle of a forest and when the land next to it was cleared for, for development. Um, this is really important because this is um, sort of suggesting that even though our residential areas, our cities may not have very many trees and we lost our forest to kind of pun intended, pave the way for, for development. And we lost a lot of carbon sequestration capacity during that process because the trees that we plant in our communities can grow two times faster or more than their forest counterpart, adding canopy cover, adding trees, 
to our yards along our streets can actually play a really important role in offsetting some of the declines in carbon uptake that have occurred over time as development replaced forest. So that's the above ground piece that we're all probably pretty familiar with. Um, what's really interesting though, is that trees actually uh, can take a lot of carbon from the atmosphere and store it in the soil. In fact, in a forest ecosystem, about half of all the carbon in that ecosystem is in the soil. Um, and if we think about just the biomass of a tree, the living biomass of the tree, maybe 30% or 40% of it is, is below ground. So we really want to think at a broader kind of ecosystem scale, the carbon benefits of trees. So how do they uh, put carbon below ground? So here's, I'm sort of zooming into a cartoon of their root system. We have these uh, coarse roots that are perennial, meaning that they sort of live for many, many years. Um, the trees often use that um, for storing energy and things like that. And then there are these little fine roots um, and that's really what the tree uses to get water and to get nutrients. Um, those little fine roots um, sort of exude these carbon rich substances into the soil to help them get more nutrients and to kind of lubricate the soil as they're growing through it. So that's one way that the, the trees are sort of directly putting carbon into the soil and storing it in the soil. The other way is those little fine roots typically only live for a few months to a year. So every year, those roots are, are dying and becoming part of that below ground, part of that soil carbon pool. And so it's through both of these mechanisms that trees not only are uh, accumulating carbon above ground, but are actually accumulating large amounts of carbon below ground in the soil. Um, to put some numbers on that, here's some data from the uh, New York City Million Trees Project and, and what they found when they collected soil samples from areas where there was very little afforestation from tree plantings versus those where there was a lot, um, the areas where there was a lot of afforestation saw more than a doubling in the amount of carbon being stored below ground. So this is like really just over a 10 year period. So when you go from no trees to having a lot of trees, even in a relatively short amount of, of time, you can see a, a meaningful and large increase in, in carbon storage below ground. So we should think about the carbon benefits of trees as not just what we can see above ground, but also what they're doing below ground. Um, the other piece, so I mentioned the thermoregulation piece, and, and so here's obviously a map of, of Westchester, and to kind of articulate sort of how powerful trees are in cooling things off at this local to regional scale. On the left, I'm showing you distributions of tree canopy across the county. So white is um, pretty much no canopy cover. The light greens are, are low canopy cover and the dark greens are um, nearly 100% canopy cover, sort of like our forest. So for context, here's Ward Pound Ridge Reservation. So our parks really pop out on here. Um, up here is, is Mountain Lake. So you can really see the spatial variations and where there's tree coverage. On the right here is um, a satellite image showing the surface temperature across Westchester. Um, the, the satellites use a very similar instrument to what we're all familiar with now when um, people are shooting that IR gun at your forehead to see what your temperature is. This is sort of like a, an IR gun on steroids attached to a satellite and we can, we can get information in a spatially resolved way about temperature across our landscape. So the, the warmer the reds, the higher the temperature, the deeper the blues, the cooler the temperature. And you can see this very clear correlation between where there's canopy cover and where things are cool. And again, on this map here, even without knowing where there's trees, I can draw a circle around Ward Pound Ridge Reservation because it's this uh, huge uh, area of, of tree coverage. Um, and so visually here, I think you can see pretty clearly that if we can increase canopy cover, we can mitigate some of the local effects of urban heat island. Urban heat island is just like sort of an artificial warming that occurs at fine spatial scales as we go from a vegetated land cover to developed land cover. Uh, and we can also uh, help to mitigate some of the impacts of climate change by, by cooling things off. Um, and, and of course, if we can cool things off, that's going to reduce our energy demand for cooling, and that is going to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. Just to kind of give you an idea of what this looks like at the municipal scale, each one of these points represents one of the different 40 some odd municipalities across Westchester. And you can see this really tight correlation between canopy cover and land surface temperature. So the municipalities that have more canopy cover are substantially cooler 
than the ones that have less canopy cover. Um, so we can see this at a variety of different spatial scales. And just across our county, there's uh, a seven or eight degree difference in, in surface temperature just because of trees. It's always important to point out Land surface temperature is not exactly the same thing as air temperature, um, but it, the spatial variations are going to be the same. Monetarily, this is important too. Um, so for those of you that who, who might be familiar, um, about 13 or 14 years ago, Worcester, Massachusetts had an outbreak of an invasive insect called the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, here's what an aerial picture of what one of these neighborhoods looked like before that outbreak. You can see there's a lot of canopy cover. Um, the insect came and then to sort of stop the spread of the insect and to quarantine the damage, um, the city had to cut down almost all of the, the hardwood trees um, across uh, parts of the city. Um, so this created, while it was terrible, it also created an opportunity to really quantify what some of the, um, the, the temperature benefits are of, of trees. And so a group from, Amherst, from UMass Amherst did this. And what they found is that in 2008, before they had to cut down all the trees, this neighborhood had nearly 40% canopy cover, used a little over seven kilowatts, um, uh, kilowatt hours per cooling degree day in the summer uh, for, for cooling uh, indoor air temperatures. Fast forward to 2009, after they cut down all the trees, um, this same neighborhood went, some, went from almost 40% canopy cover to just a little over 7%. Um, and there was about a 40% increase in energy consumption for, for cooling. Um, so, so we can see this sort of in a theoretical framework, but we can also see it in this very real monetary real life situation here. Um, so, okay, so hopefully I've convinced you if you're at this talk, you probably already believe that, that um, trees are important to have around. And so what do we do to maximize the climate benefits of trees? Um, the first thing I would say is maintain what you have. It's not nearly as sexy or attractive as like planting a whole bunch of new trees, um, but, but the tree that is best able to perform the ecosystem services that we want are the ones that are healthy and still there. Um, and so to give you an idea of, of why we really need to think about this, here's a map showing the land covers across Westchester County. The greens is everywhere we have forests, the reds and pink are developed. Um, across the county, pretty much everywhere, we are losing canopy cover and we are losing forest cover. Um, here's town by town, how that works out. You can see it's really the northern part of the county where we're losing forest the fastest um, in this 15 year period. Um, some municipalities have, have lost about three square kilometers of, of forest area. Um, so this is, it, it's ongoing, it's happening pretty quickly. We need to be mindful of this um, moving, moving forward. So we need, we're, we're sort of past the point of really increasing canopy cover. Where we are now is we want to slow the rate of, of loss. Um, what we've done is we developed a really simple model to help us better understand which areas of forest might be most at risk. And so municipalities can use this to think about where they might want to preserve land or change um, zoning and, and, and uh, planning policies. Um, basically, we pulled together data on where there's steep slope, where there's protected land, where there's parcels that have forests that can be subdivided, and we come up with these maps where basically the reds are the areas that are most at risk for development. Um, when we look at this across the county, um, this red area is at the highest risk. We see about 40% of the forests that are left in Westchester are in this sort of higher risk category. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of like how well this model works, it's, it's really simple. In 2010, um, here's a close-up of an area. This red is indicating um, an area that our model sort of predicted would be at the highest risk of development. Um, fast forward to 2021. Um, indeed, this area was developed and the boundary of what was developed almost perfectly corresponds to our red area that we delineated would be the highest likelihood of getting developed. Um, what's more is we can see this really large change in temperature in that part of land as we go from 2010 when it was still forest to 2021 when it was when it was developed. So again, it's carbon, it's also temperature. These things work together to um, uh, impact the climate implications of having trees or losing trees. Um, 
I always get asked the question about like, okay, well, what species do we plan? And, and um, Jessica's gonna get to this as well. Um, I don't have a great answer for you. All I can say is species may matter. Um, as one example, here's a paper that was published based on some trees in, in New York City and, and how quickly they, they grow. Um, right off the bat, I want to put a big X through cherry and, and uh, pear trees. Don't plant those. So that's the, the green and the, and the purple here. Instead, let's focus on white pine and London plane trees. Um, I love both these trees. I think London plane trees, they do amazing in, in urban areas um, uh, and, and white pines can, go, can grow pretty quickly. This just kind of gives you an idea of what their carbon sequestration rates are over time. Um, but, um, and there's, there's a big but here, um, I would argue that site conditions, how we manage trees and, and the health of the tree could be even more important than the species of tree that, that we plant. So, so it's not as simple as just like picking uh, a one particular species, but it's really the full package that we need to be mindful of. Um, and so again, I'm showing you this as an example of some data, but it's not the Bible. So don't use this as a strict guide. Um, and then the last thing on this front that I'll mention is, is um, one of the most important things as we're thinking about planting trees is to plant the right tree in the right location. Um, all, all of our trees will, will have important um, climate and biodiversity benefits, um, but we don't wanna plant a big oak tree right by a power line, right? And so there's some of these small trees provide a lot of really important benefits. And if we plant them in places where we can't plant big trees, we'll still have trees there providing those services. So it's not just the species, but, but where, where it's getting planted. Um, okay, the last thing that I'll, I'll finish up with is, um, just some statistics we have from across the county, like what works, what doesn't work. Um, lots of communities are passing different tree ordinances. Um, some of these tree ordinances, you have to get a permit to remove trees. There's also some municipalities like Pleasantville where I live, where there's a tree planting program. And what we find when we look at these data is that across the board, everybody's losing canopy cover, but it seems that tree planting programs um, seem to have the biggest impact in slowing that rate of canopy loss. Um, I, I need to caution, A, this is preliminary data. B, it's every one of these programs is different. So it's hard to like really lump them into the categories as neatly as I do here. But it, but it might suggest that a planting program um, uh, might be one of the, the best approaches that we can put forth. Um, and right, if you're not familiar with it, check out Planting Westchester, it provides a lot of resources to helping uh, uh, understand a lot of these things that we're talking about today. Um, and then the last thing is, is, I think tree inventories are really important. I'll just throw this up, up here as a free, easy to use app that can help communities do this themselves. In the q and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit later. And I realize I went a few minutes over and I apologize for that. So um, anyway, um, I'll take any questions you guys have later uh, or whenever is, is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. That was just fascinating. Um, and next we have Jessica Schuler. She's the program coordinator of natural resources for Westchester County Departments of Park, Rec and Conservation, responsible for Lasden Park Arboretum and Veterans Memorial and Hilltop Hanover Farm. She's part of a team that manages natural resources across 18,000 acres of Westchester County parkland, working to conserve biodiversity and practice sustainable management. Jessica earned a BS in plant science with distinction in research from Cornell University, is a horticulturalist, an ISA certified arborist, and a certified ecological restoration practitioner. She's going to talk to us about actions we can take to help the future of our forest, neighborhoods, and town, including planting for climate adaptability and biodiversity, preventing and managing invasive species, urban forest management, and citizen science. Welcome, Jessica. Hey, thank you, Eve, and good evening, everyone. Um, Andy had a perfect segue into what I'm going to talk about. So, get this shared.
sorry, I think I was. Jessica is freezing. She may want to turn her video off. There it goes. Hi everyone, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. It looks like Jessica's freezing. So when she comes back on, we'll ask her to turn off her video and hopefully that'll solve it. Thanks for your patience. I I think we can hear you, Jessica. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm back. I don't know what happened there. As soon as I shared my screen, I, I like froze and died out. So I'm gonna keep my video off and let's try that again. Okay. Okay, so the title of my talk is Our Once and Future Forests. We all are um, experiencing lots of changes that are happening in our forest canopy. And Andy showed some really great maps and data, um, but this is really a generational um, time for us to see how much things can shift so quickly. And we are seeing the impacts of the changing climate on our trees from these increased temperature changes, and um, also in droughts, we've been experiencing droughts, as well as the increased storms and flooding. Some of these things have led to phenology shifts, which are the timing of events um, that greatly impact our trees across the season. So when plants are leafing out, to when they're flowering and fruiting, and then ultimately dropping leaves in the fall. Um, and lastly, uh, pests and diseases is something that is really on the rise uh, for sure. Uh, when trees are stressed, they tend to um, attract these things and they're weakened, they can't fight them off. So they play a huge role as well as invasive species. So invasive species are those that are non-native to our region and uh, ones that cause harm. And what I'm showing here is the blonding effect that we find in our woods right now, once the emerald ash borer has been present for a few years, and then all of a sudden the woodpeckers catch on and they go through. Um, it was amazing when I first arrived at Lasden Park in Arboretum in 2020, uh, this blonding hadn't happened to our ash trees yet. And it seemed like just over a course of a week, all of a sudden all these trees looked like this and none of them leaped out the following year. And so it can be daunting and it's, it's really scary. It's frightening to see so much change uh, in our local environment. And so there are so many things that we can do as a community uh, and take action to help. Uh, and so some of the things I wanna to touch base on today is looking at how we manage our urban forest and the importance of it. Uh, planting for climate adaptability. There's some new research out and there are things that we can prioritize. Uh, planting for biodiversity. So thinking about the diversity of the tree species we're planting, but then also thinking about the life that they support. Uh, preventing and managing invasive species. And then how can we uh, as a community contribute to data collection and science overall through civic science or citizen science? And so um, this picture here is just um, a good example of some of these storm events that we've been up against uh, in the last decade. So uh, this was uh, from Superstorm Sandy uh, in New York City, the Thame Family Forest at the New York Botanical Garden. And we had already started proactively managing that woodland prior to this huge disturbance. Um, so they lost about 160 trees that were six inches or greater in um, diameter at breast height. And so that was a really large canopy disturbance, but because we had already been proactively managing it, 
you're able to maintain the woodland and, and have native forests regenerate there with our active management. Um, and so what is urban forest management? Um, there are two ways in which you can look at the urban forest, one of which is um, the street trees uh, in your cities or along your, um, in your towns. There's also trees in parks or in your yards. That's one, that's the sort of the traditional um, thought of urban forest, that, that overall canopy that Andy was, was sort of talking about in those um, more developed areas. Uh, but then there's also urban woodland management uh, where you have natural areas and you can actually restore them and into functioning ecosystems. So mimicking nature and resetting that sort of trajectory of regeneration and establishment of the forest canopy. Um, and so traditionally uh, we were, we learned very quickly that um, street trees in particular, um, we needed to plant for more diversity. And the most per perfect example of this is uh, elm trees that we uh, monocultured in many cities across the United States, but then they were uh, greatly impacted by the, um, the uh, introduction of an invasive species, the Dutch elm disease. Um, and so in the 1980s, the um, field of arboriculture, the study of trees, um, came up with this, this idea for planting for diversities, where we in our cities along our streets should plant for no more than 10 species, 10% 10 of one species, no more than 20% of one genus, and no more than 30% of one family. So this is a really great goal to have as you are thinking about your, your planting in your towns and um, also in your cities across Westchester County. And one way in which we can accomplish this is if you know what you have. So you have to do a tree inventory. And many, many, many um, municipalities I know are accomplishing this and it's so great to see, uh, but you need to know what you have in order to know what you can plant to add to this. Um, what needs to be maintained and pruned um, and, and to move onward. So the data is essential um, and, and we can then move forward and track uh, the changes in our overall forest canopy using the data that Andy has been presenting. Um, so what is it gonna look like 10 years from now after we've planted? Post-planting care is part of that management plan. Uh, so we can't just go out and say, okay, well, I'm going to plant um, a million trees in New York City, right? That's what they did. Uh, but they had a lot of support behind them all, and they had watering plans and street tree pruners and advocates who and volunteers who went out there who then also inventoried using that app that Andy uh, showed at the end of his presentation. So there has to be post-planting care. It has to come full circle when you're doing that. And a lot of it um, results in that maintenance becoming proactive. So knowing your pruning schedule, um, having a budget to hire companies to go out and do that. When you do young plantings, make sure you go out and plan the next two to five years to do corrective pruning on any of the young trees because when they're younger, it's easier to fix those problems. And there are tremendous resources around us. So we have um, a really great active New York State Arborist Association. We also have the New York State um, Urban Forestry Council, as well as uh, New York Relief, which is sort of a public facing part of the DEC and the Urban Forestry Council and our local cooperative extension. Use these resources, they're available to you in this process. And so the US Forest Service has been working on climate modeling and they have this um, climate change atlas for trees that they've taken these climate models and also looked at uh, native plant distributions and what they are predicting to be the most adaptable to these shifts in our climate. And so this is taken from this urban area number 63217 in uh, for the tri-state area. And um, these are the trees that they're recommending right now for us to be prioritizing in our planting. 
Um, so this is one resource in which anyone can access. It's part of the federal government. Um, and so it's the, the Climate Tree Atlas. Uh, through the US Forest Service. So when we start selecting our species, this may be a, a good resource for you to start. And keeping in mind too, of where we're planting. And so the US, um, US um, Environmental Protection Agency ma maintains this database. And what this is, is uh, an image of all the eco regions of the U United States. So if you zoom in, to any particular location, you can delve into different um, uh, plant communities uh, and what is functioning and, and living and growing together, as well as how um, they form together with the non-living environment. So our soils and our water and um, our bedrock and all of that. So um, taking a little bit of an example in data format from uh, Professor Doug Talame. If you look at where chestnut oaks grow, this is the distribution of chestnut oaks overlaid onto those ecoregions. So thinking about where they live. Um, and then looking into more closely what feeds on the chestnut oaks. And so this is a little hair streak that um, loves chestnut oaks. And these are the hair streak observations um, seen overlaid uh, from uh, iNaturalist observations. Uh, and then what else is feeding on those insects? So this is one tree species, one caterpillar, and the life it's supporting. And so these are the things that we need to also think about, not only how the trees, the right plant, the right place, but what else they're supporting and how everything is interconnected. And this stems into a field that's called ecological restoration. So it is repairing an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. And there are lots of great resources to look and, and reference plant, native plant communities into our landscape practice. Uh, and so the Society for Ecological Restoration is a great starting point, but our colleagues in New York City Parks have been doing this since the 1980s, if not earlier, and they've developed a, a native species planting guide uh, that is applicable for us here in Westchester. And what's great about it is they target um, not just uh, the various plant communities across the city that many of which come up to us in Westchester, but it also um, uh, breaks down uh, conditions. So looking at plant communities as a reference to various conditions. So a dry, sunny spot versus a moist, shady place. Um, and so you can also um, reference those for street trees and they have street tree recommendations in this book as well. New York State DEC is coming up with a native species planting guide. Um, it's still pending publication. I haven't seen that yet. And right now we are one year into the UN decade of ecosystem restoration. And there is a website that you can go to with toolkits and information about communities doing restoration, tree planting, all of the above worldwide. Um, and that is an incredible resource for anybody looking to take action. And so locally, where do you get these plants? And more and more, we're finding that sourcing plant material is, is becoming harder and harder. Um, and so uh, we have some local resources. Uh, the first right now is the New York State Saratoga Tree Nursery. They provide bare root saplings. Uh, every spring. In fact, if you want them delivered to Westchester County, we will pick them up for you and provide them and hand them out for free. Um, after you, you have to buy the trees, but the delivery is free if you want to come to Lazen Park and pick them up. So we'll offer that in April. Planting Westchester that uh, Andy recommended is uh, going to be an excellent resource. And, and we hear it's, it's going to be coming live sometime soon, uh, focusing on the trees as the priority. Um, so that will be an excellent resource. Our Cornell Cooperative Extension Office, um, they provide uh, excellent master gardeners as well as other um, information uh, through workshops and, and pest and disease and soil testing. 
all that is necessary for caring for our trees properly. And the Native Plant Center, um, Lasden Park, we are an arboretum and, and anybody, a lot of people call us and say, oh, I'd let, what, how often is the arboretum open or <laughs> um, when can I visit? So we are open 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. daily and we are Westchester's public garden with a focus on trees. So come and visit us, we are there for you. Um, and a newer program that you may not be so much aware of, and, and we're looking forward to ramping it up, is uh, Hilltop Hanover Farm is not only Westchester County's farm, but we are also a source for local ecotypes, so of native plants. Not necessarily trees yet, but uh, we have experts who go out and collect these seeds, then um, grow them in plots, and so that wild, um, the wild genotypes are actually present in the plants that we're producing. So um, we as humans often select plants uh, for their genetic diversity. And when it comes to tree planting, we have lots of, lots of options in, in what we're planting too, not just the species, but how we go about physically planting the tree. Um, and so the best times to plant trees are uh, coming up a sort of mid-March through uh, mid-May comfortably. Um, and then again in the fall, October, November. Um, and so we have three different options. There's bare root planting, though there are some restrictions there. And when you can plant uh, bare root trees, um, because they are definitely more sensitive. They're being shipped to you or brought to you without any soil. So you have to move rather quickly. And that's what you get from the Saratoga Tree Nursery. Containerized plants are excellent uh, because they're easy to move around and they don't tend to be as big as bald and burlap trees, but you have to be careful of roots and um, actually the roots can girdle themselves eventually. So you have to be mindful of how you tease out the pots and, and get them into the ground. And then bald and burlap trees is, is a, a very popular way, though it's not necessarily practical when you're doing this with volunteers, if that's how your community is taking action. Um, but Planting Westchester provides more um, resources on this, and I would be happy to help you um, think through your planting process. And invasive species is a hot topic for us right now. We are seeing that in our ash trees, as I had uh, previously showed, but we also have vines. I think before I started, I, I saw somebody tap into the Q&A about our vinelands that are developing across the county and it's a significant problem. We are in it for the long haul with these um, and they are embedded in our soil seed banks. So actively managing the vines has gotta be a top priority for our trees because they do take them down. Uh, and in the areas in which our forest gaps open up, they quickly move in. So we do have to manage them. And to take action very quickly, um, I suggest that if you haven't already joined or signed up for the Lower Hudson Prism, the Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, please do sign up for their listserv. That's a great resource. And here, um, join one of the fine cutters uh, working group. So Bob Del Torto here is the founder of Vine Cutters along the Bronx River Parkway Reservation. Um, but there are vine cutter groups showing up in many municipalities now, and it's really great to see that this has taken off. It's really important for us to continue this, this work to save our trees. The main insects that are, are greatly impacting our forests, like the emerald ash borer right now, um, they get vectored around in firewood. So it's not just related to um, the trees we're planting, but we also have to consider how we are removing our trees, what we're doing with the end product and where you move that to. So in, in New York state, you're not supposed to move firewood beyond 50 miles from where it was harvested. Now, I would like to take that even further. Really, ash trees, whether they're infected or not, you shouldn't be moving off-site unless it's chipped or burned um, within a year of it being removed. So you have to look at those regulations and understand that you can potentially vector 
some of these serious pests that are greatly impacting our forests, not just our, our, our forested areas and that tree canopy, but our urban forests as well. And um, one of the best tools we have is to plant native plants and to move forward with ecological restoration wherever we possibly can. And um, citizen science is a really, really important tool as well. Right now we have nipping at our heels or um, hitching rides on our trucks and our pallets, a spotted lantern fly that is establishing in New York City. Um, it was interesting to learn that they are asking people to now kill them in New York City when they see them. For us up here in Westchester, if you see one, snap a picture and send an email. So if you see something, say something. We have to report it to the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. Or you can also let me know uh, at Westchester County Parks and we'll get it to the right person because we're still trying to track it spread up into Westchester County. And so lastly, contributing to that overall data. And there are ways in which uh, trees uh, can um, be monitored. And so the Healthy Trees, um, Healthy Cities app that Andy had mentioned is a great one that communities can um, sign on, get the app, follow the online tutorials and learn more about planting, um, collecting data on those trees and caring for them for the long-term management. IMAP Invasives and iNaturalist are ways in which you can um, document biodiversity. Um, and the spread of invasive species, and then phenology. So tracking how climate change is impacting our trees by documenting when they're leafing out and when they're flowering and producing fruit in the fall. Um, so with that, um, I want you to consider and think about all these options and, and how you can actually take action and Let's let this next nine years of the decade on ecological restoration really flourish and grow here in Westchester County. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jessica. And I will mention that we did just start a local chapter of vine cutters. So for those of you who are interested in coming out and uh, cutting some vines, uh, but we would like to move over to the discussion section. And we do have as our moderator, Bud Viverka. Bud has served as the director of land management uh, since 2016 at one of our amazing local partners, the Mianus River Gorge. Previously, Bud spent 10 years working as a wildlife biologist in several states across the South and Midwest. And today his work focuses on invasive species management and Northeastern forest restoration. He's the organizational representative to the Lower Hudson Partnership for Invasive Species Management. Bud, can you please start us off with a question for our panelists? Yes, thank you very much for having me on. Great work and great presentations from Jessica and Andy. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, we've got some, some questions here uh, from some of our folks who have been on the line with us and, and, and watching our presentation. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and start in the Q&A with a couple of the questions that are there. We'll move on to some of the other ones I have. Um, first question we have is, uh, is, is there any experience on from what Jessica or Andy you've heard from or even from Eve of towns uh, passing codes to reduce land development or to encourage landowners to donate land back to municipalities or to a land trust. I, I haven't heard of any. The one thing I did recently see come across from the state is there's a fund for municipalities or towns to purchase land for their for its protection. Um, but I haven't heard of any local laws, but that doesn't mean it's not out there. And it could be a, you know, somebody gets inspired from hearing this. So <laughs> we yeah. may see something. Um, so there were some questions. Um, I know Jessica, you showed the list of, of species and trees there from the plant locally. Um, and then, you know, are those trees, uh, you know, on the list were uh, the ones that are best for the climate change? Are those the ones that are best for climate change coming up? Based on what the US Forest Service is modeling, yes. That's, that's based on their research. 
And then another question related to that was that a sugar maple, many people, and a question was asked, or is no longer recommended for this area, um, but it's on their lists. So is there any explanation you have for that? Or is it, is it just its adaptability that they found? Yes, so, um, you know, I kind of feel like that is a little bit of a misnomer. because I feel like I just heard Nina Basic um, speak on this too, where is if they're in the right place, for growth where they need, they do need more soil volume. Um, they're doing fine. Actually, one of the plants we saw regenerating quite heavily in different patches in the Thame family forest at NYBG was sugar maple. It was responding really well to any disturbance and it was coming up just fine. Um, so, you know, maybe it's that for the long term, maybe they won't get as big here, but they still are, are saying that we can plant them and we can grow them. I don't know, Andy, what have what have you found? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely at nearing the sort of the southern climate limit of its of its natural range, and and um, northern Westchester is the southernmost commercial sugar bush in 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 the state, and, there, and there's and there's just one to kind of I guess just give an idea of of, of where they're important. Um, I mean, I, I I don't know. Like, I sugar maple is my favorite tree, so I mm -hmm. you know it's, it's hard to like say you shouldn't plant one of your your children, I guess. Um, but yeah, I I they I I would probably like shy away from it, and unless I was sure that the soil conditions were were right for for sugar maple, um, they're probably not gonna like a whole lot of heat, especially if it's dry, but if you have the soil volume where they can get their roots a little deeper and get the water, maybe they'll do just fine. And also, you know, um, mature trees can handle a much wider climate range than little seedlings. So sometimes like what we can plant and maintain could do well far outside of the range where we would expect it to be naturally. Yeah, and I can speak from the gorge itself. Um, in our studies and our tree inventories, sugar maple was one of our greatest um, kind of regenerators and is one of the most dominant trees in our mid-story and uh, understory. So it's it's there and it's, it's one of the ones that comes back first. Mm -hmm. um, sticking with maples, um, we have a question that somebody has Norway maples in their property and their property is dominated by it. And they wonder about removing them um, because they are a non-native species and replace native maples. Um, and what is the trade-off of say removing that and trying to put something different there and removing that species that's there in a mature tree and planting something small in its place that won't be viable for say 20 or 30 years? Um, should they go ahead and remove those non-native trees or just leave them there because of the, the effect they're having? I mean, I hate Norway maple. <laughs> um, I think I think if you're in a position where you can like actively manage it in a way where you can replace it with um, uh, something that that can take its place, like that's really important. Taking Norway maple down and doing nothing, you're probably just gonna get a whole lot of invasives to come back. But if you're in a position where you can manage that stand and, and help to rehabilitate it in the long run, it's probably beneficial to replace it with, with oak and or um, sugar maple or, or tulip tree or something like that. Um, but I think the important thing is just like having to stay on top of it because Norway maple produces a deep shade so there's probably some invasives that aren't going to do particularly well under it, but um, there's a reason the Norway maple's there. It's probably because of some past disturbance to the land or something like that that already sets the stage for uh, invasives to proliferate. And so I think it's one of those things where if if you can sort of take that that long game view of it and and put in the effort to making that transition in the long run, it would probably be beneficial to replace it with with something native. Yeah, I agree. No, I, I agree and make it have a long term plan. Um, and so when you are taking down individual trees, and your goal is ultimately a, a, a native forest, don't chip, don't chip the wood. Let's establish that coarse woody debris later and that also you won't be releasing that carbon very quickly. Um, and you can start mimicking the, the forest floor and then start introducing our, your native um, your native overstory trees into the area. 
Excellent, excellent. Um, moving to another question. Um, how should you manage the land under and around the trees you say you have in your yard or along the edge of your yard? So um, turf grass up against trees is, is not favorable. So I would remove um, any grass at least um, directly underneath the drip zone or uh, of the tree. And, and again, you wanna mimic forest soil there too. So um, don't use tremendous amounts of wood mulch. Um, you, if you could use a, a nice even thin layer of um, composted leaves or composted wood chip mulch a little bit, really no more than an inch um, per year, that would be a way to go. Or um, I would I would prefer the route of um, underneath those trees, really trying to mimic an ecosystem if you can. Uh, so introduce uh, some native uh, shrubs and also wildflowers and, and grasses underneath. And Andy, do you have any additional comment to that? No, I think all that sounds great. I think well, oftentimes what you see in people's yards is over time the soil erodes and you can start to see the the roots starting to emerge above the soil and that's not very good for trees so anything that you can do that will help to like sort of protect the root zone um keep the soil beneath it moist so like jessica was saying some sort of mulch or keeping leaves there or something like that um is is super helpful yeah one of the, one of the easiest things you can do there is just not remove the leaves that are underneath those trees yeah <laughs> um, so we do have uh, some of the, uh, you know, in, invasive species coming in and we have trees that are, are dying back um, from that. Um, if you have some trees, uh, what is the best thing to do with a tree that is dead? Um, and we can talk about the different locations of where that may be and, and how you would manage. So go ahead. Yeah, so the biggest thing with trees, um is whether or not you have a target. And, and if you are concerned about this, you can also hire a, a consulting arborist or a, a company to come in and have a look. But that's, that's the number one concern is safety. Um, if you don't, if it's in a woodland or in a woodland edge and um, you don't have anything in the way where it's dangerous, then you can, you can leave it standing. They're great for habitat. Um, if you're concerned about the, the branches breaking off, you can top them at a certain height and they're still good for habitat. Uh, and again, that same idea that they're slowly releasing carbon and decaying back um, into the ecosystem. Um, if you don't like that look, I would also recommend just dropping them in place and leaving them there. Um, Cause then you also don't have to worry about any spread of disease, just keeping it all on site. Great. Um, I'm not sure where we are with time, how much we have time left, but yeah, we're, we're finishing up here. Um, I'll do uh, one more question here. Um, and, uh, you know, guys might touch on many of the questions that people had about tree size and what to plant and how to plant it. Um, but I think, you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, uh, we talked about vines and what you should do there. And, um, you know, I think we've answered a lot of the questions. We'll have to take this one last question here, and it's about a local school. And so a local school is participating in what's called a tree plantish, which uh, planted trees equivalent to what they plant trees equivalent to what a, a supply of paper in that school year. Um, and so um, what should they be doing or what should the advice would you give in terms of what to plant, and where to plant it? say in around the school in itself in that local area to kind of uh, kind of subplant that that tree species um this i think easily would be something would be a lot of volunteers and a lot of kids so that'd be kind of reference what we would need to, they would need to plant what an awesome program i'm excited about this um Yes, so the very first thing you need to do is a site analysis. You have to look and see what you have and, and also um, what restrictions you have. Um, and so that's the first step in designing a planting plan. Uh, you can do soil tests too to know what, what soils you have. Um, and then you can, that will help you devise what species to plant and where to plant them. Um, and 
once you have those all sourced and ready to go, then you got to do your, your, your site prep and, and make sure everything's good to go. But yeah, I definitely am involved volunteers and all the students at that school. What an incredible program. Yeah, same thing. I think where it depends on where you're going to plant it um, and just plant something appropriate. Not everything has to be a big giant oak. Anything is better mm -hmm. than than, than nothing and planting a big oak in some place that an oak doesn't belong. It's just gonna put you in a situation where you're cutting it down before too long. Mm -hmm. And I'll make a final statement. I do deal in a lot of uh, invasive species and um, we'll be working with the town of Bedford um, and the Bedford Garden Club on uh, advising people on what they should have in their yards. But you know, with invasive species, um, yeah, they do they take up a lot of space and people say, well, there's a lot of green there and, and everything, but you know, you really should remove those species. They're not healthy for the ecosystem. They don't definitely don't follow the 10% of one species or 20% of one of, of one family. So, uh, you know, remove those invasive species, plant native shrubs, um, or even in air, certain areas, just open that forest up. Um, species like uh, Japanese barberry occupy areas that typically didn't have shrubs before in them. They were more of an open forest. So you can just open those up a little bit and allow those trees then to become healthier because a lot of those invasive species are pulling resources away from those native trees. Um, I'll just add, um, since you brought up barberry, um, in places where we have natural forests, like we have to do something to, to maintain deer populations. Um, like they'll eat everything else and pave the way for invasives to, to come in. Great. Well, before you go, I want to very quickly mention a couple of upcoming events that we have. Um, as I mentioned, we do have our own um, vine cutters group. So if you'd like to come uh, learn about removing invasive vines and cut some vines, they're meeting on Saturdays. Uh, the next one is February 26th. We have the story of plastic, which is part of our environmental film series with a fabulous lineup of speakers on Tuesday, March 8th, 7 to 8 p.m. at the Bedford Playhouse. We also have on the same day a, a watch party the morning of Tuesday, March 8th, also at the Playhouse for International Women's Day, Gender Equality Today for Sustainable Tomorrow. We also have our fabulous Earth Day Festival, mark your calendar for Sunday, April 24th at the Bedford Hills train station. Lots of education, information, fun activities for all ages. And of course, uh, our energy coach, for those of you who would like to learn how to save some, uh, save energy and money from your home or your building, uh, you can sign up. Those are absolutely free of charge to you. Uh, so we encourage you to do that. And also you'll wanna save the date for Saturday night, May 24th for our moon dance. It's typically a sold out event. Tickets are available online. And for all of these things, uh, just go to our website, bedford2030.org. We hope you will join us, learn, participate, volunteer, and take action against climate change. Thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, Andy and Jessica. That was fabulous. You did a great job moderating. Uh, we appreciate that, bud. And also uh, for uh, the answering the questions in the Q&A, Karen Simons, and to all of you for your attention and your interest in trees and canopy in Bedford and for joining us in our effort to ensure a healthy, sustainable environment in Bedford now and in the future. We thank you so much. Have a good evening. Good night, everybody. Good night.